Okay, um, good morning and thank you very much for coming and for tuning this session. I'm not sure I would have done if I didn't have to be here delivering it, um, but I think you're all going to enjoy it. Um, my name is Janine Boone, I work on London Underground, I'm a uh, station supervisor at Bank Monument Supporting Transfer Lane Station, so um, actually it's a condition of my contract of employment that I tell you that what I say today should not be taken to represent the views of Transport for London or London Underground, although I suspect that by the end of what I've said, you wouldn't think that anyway. Um, so I don't think that's going to be a problem. I'm going to do an illustrated talk for about 20 minutes, and then we'll... Um, it be easier to close up slightly distracting door then. Um, and then you can ask me lots of questions, and I shall at various points be shamelessly plugging my book, which my lovely assistant here is going to hold up. There you go. Plundering London Underground. Usually £12.95, but a mere tenner to you today. Um, if by the end of this talk you want to know more. Okay, so, London Underground. The first journey in London Underground was made in 1863. So we're going to be looking through the 152-year history of London Underground. As we'll be doing that in 20 minutes, obviously we are going to skip a bit. So if I don't cover when exactly your favourite station was built, or your favourite tunnel was drilled, then you'll have to forgive me for that, okay? Also, um, I don't want to just give you a long list of dates and facts about London Underground. I expect when someone gives a history talk, talk that it's not just um, a load of facts and dates, that they also give their own analysis and their own theory, okay? And in my studies of the history of London Underground, this is essentially Janine's theory of the history of London Underground, right? Is that London Underground... How well it does in any given period of its history depends essentially on five factors. Funding, the level to which it is integrated, its ownership, its governance, and its ethos. Right? We're going to look at that in a bit more detail later on in my talk, but bear in mind as we go through each stage of the underground history, have a think about where we are with each of those five factors and see if you agree with me um, that those factors influence how well London Underground is doing at any given time. Okay, let's go right back to the start, the early years. First journey, like I said, in 1863. First London Underground journey was operated by the Metropolitan Railway. So that's a private company, the Metropolitan Railway, from Bishop's Road, Paddington, to Farringdon Street, three and three quarter miles. It was a steam train. Over the next decade, it was joined by several other new lines being built around the place by different companies. Although I was a bit historically inaccurate then, referring to them as lines, because they were not called lines. They weren't considered lines of London Underground. They were called railways. So there you have there a thing called the Central London Railway, which you'll, you'll look at that and you'll, you'll think, well, that actually looks quite a bit like the central line, particularly the top bit. And it did become the central line later. Um, but in this period of time, different private companies set up different railways that ran under, under the ground. 1908 was a crucial year because 1908 was when the concept of a London underground um, was created. So that's the first time it was called the London underground. It's the first time it had a logo. Um, it's the first time, the private companies that ran all these different railways, the Central London Railway, the Metropolitan Railway, etc., got together and said, let's create a joint, a common identity as London Underground, produce a uh, London Underground map. We know the, the iconic map we have these days was, was uh, drafted by Harry Beck sometime after this, but just the idea of having a map of, the un of London Underground, having leaflets that advertise London Underground, that happened in 1908, but it still wasn't a single organisation, it was still a separate private company for each of what we would now call London Underground Lines. In the 1920s, okay, crucially in 1921, the Trade Facilities Act provided for government financial guarantees for private operators to promote employment. Now politically this is very important. So at the time, let's see if we can think of any comparisons to today, at the time, there was a Tory Liberal coalition government and an economic recession, right? And the government thought, unlike today, that the way to deal with an economic 
particularly because it was under pressure from people more politically to the left to do this, that one of the things you should do in economic recession is you should spend money to build public services and create jobs. In my view, damn shame that view isn't taken today. Okay, but that's the view that was taken in the, in the 20s. Maybe not to the extent that some of us would have wanted, but it was taken to a certain extent, as a result of which a lot of investment came into the London Underground. It's still separate private companies though, but it's getting investment, and the investment's coming deliberately, not just to improve the underground, but to create jobs at a time of high unemployment. So that's when, for example, the exa um, you get extensions to the Metropolitan, the Hampstead, the Hampstead Tube, which is now part of the Northern Line, the Piccadilly and District Lines, and you can see on there the bits up to Edgware, connecting Camden Town and Houston, and what's now the Bank Branch, uh, the Southern Extension to Morden. They were all built, built during the 20s because of this period of investment as a good way to deal with the economic recession. And the other thing that happens in the 1920s, at the end of the 1920s, is 55 Broadway, which is a building directly above St James's Park. Classic example of Art Deco architecture in London, which has just been sold off to be redeveloped for private flats. Boom. Mm -hmm. okay. That opened in 1929, before London Underground even became uh, an, an organisation in the public sector. That was opened as the headquarters of the Underground Group, which was like the, you know, the club for the different underground, separate underground private companies. And then it came into public hands in a certain way, which I'll explain. Anyone know who that fellow up there is? That's Herbert Morrison. Okay, so in 1929, a minority Labour government um, is elected. Herbert Morrison has a background in London local government, having been on the London County Council, and he drafts a bill to bring London Transport, the tube and the buses, into public hands under the control of a, of, of, of a public body. The reason for this is because all these separate private companies, although they've tried to integrate with their common headquarters and their common uh, logo and all that kind of stuff, it's still chaotic. It's chaotic because it's so fragmented. They're still competing against each other, even while they're cooperating with each other. And London's becoming a bit of a chaotic mess. So his solution is to bring it into public hands. Before he had the chance to do that, however, this is a whole other story, uh, Ramsay MacDonald turned tail, ran from the Labour Party, joined the Tories, formed the national government, etc. But actually, Morrison's bill survived. And Morrison's bill was one of the few draft Labour Party bills which the national government, again a Labour Tory coalition, um, brought, brought into force anyway. And it was passed in 1933 as the London Passenger Transport Act. And this is how Morrison described it. He said, here is I, without a socialist majority, determined to go into some scheme of public ownership. However, it's worth scrutinising it in a bit more detail what sort of public ownership it was is why this next slide says into public hands again, but with a question mark on the end, okay? The London Passenger Transport Board was the body created to run London Underground, and Morrison said it should be a small board of business men of proven capacity, right? So not of railway workers, not of elected representatives of passengers, etc., but business men of proven capacity. And in fact, most of the leading positions on that board were given to the owners of the private companies who they've just taken London Underground away from. Um, so people like Ashfield and Pitt, for those of you who are familiar with London, they'll recognise um, those kind of names. In its first year in public hands, its stockholders, which are mainly the former private owners, received £5 million in dividends. Now, I think £5 million is quite a lot of money now. I'm pretty sure in the 1930s it was really a lot of money. <laughs> and, yet, and yet the service was not getting much better, okay? And it was, that was a quote from a Communist Party pamphlet at the time that says that by 1936 there was a rising storm of protests by passengers and seething discontent among workers. We we're always seething discontent, those of us who work on the tube. Um, and this man here, can I remember who this man here is? That's Ernest Bevin, right? So Ernest Bevin was a trade union leader who was part of the Labour government as well. He described Morrison's design of the public ownership as positively the worst form of public control. Okay? Now, this couldn't go on. People wanted London Underground to come into public hands because they wanted it to get better, whether they travelled on it or whether they worked on it, okay? And then it did get better. It took a couple of years 
into the public ownership of it to get it better, and then it got seriously better because it got a big funding injection. Okay? And from 1937, we had a thing called the New Works Programme. Substantial new investment and job creation. Again, like in the 20s, let's get some money into it to not only improve the underground, but also to create jobs in a period of unemployment. Only this time, now it's publicly owned. That can be direct funding, not just loan guarantees like it was in the 20s. Central line was extended, the Northern line was extended, the Piccadilly line was extended, the Bakerloo line was extended. The Metropolitan line was electrified north of uh, Rickmansworth. It had st been st still been steam trained up to then. Um, it was electrified. New tunnels were uh, built, new stations, new escalators were fitted. The New Works programme did slow uh, <coughs> during the Second World War for obvious reasons, but despite that, <coughs> the result of the New Works programme is that London Underground services were running 18% faster in 1947 than they had done in 1933. Now, for a 14 year period, which included a six year war, that's actually a hell of an achievement. And it's why often this period, the period of the New Works Programme, when we have public ownership for the first time with substantial investment, is seen as what you might call a heyday. And in fact, you know, I've been putting little quotes in. Actually, the best quote I could find for this book was from my own book. Apologies, <laughs> that's kind of egotistical. But as Janine Booth says in her book, um, for the first time, some degree of each of the first five factors, public ownership, London control, adequate funding, integration, <coughs> and public service were all in place together. Not perfectly, not totally, but they were together. Okay, 1948, nationalisation. So in 1948, the Labour government brought the railways into public ownership. Now, I'm, I'm quite a fan of what is commonly called nationalisation, um, but I would actually say what I'm a fan of is public ownership. Now, usually, that's a semantic difference. Usually people, when they say nationalisation, they mean public ownership. But actually, one of the, this is one example where it's worth noting that there are actually two very different things. Because public ownership means being owned by a body of the state, but actually it doesn't have to be the national state. And nationalisation literally means public ownership by the national state. And I would advocate that London Underground should be publicly owned, but by a London state body. And this point of its history is a very good example of why. Because you've just had this you know, golden age, new works programme, investment expansion, etc. Then it gets nationalised along with the rest of the railways, which was brilliant for the railways, for the national railways. They got much better. But the rest of the, on the underground, the rest of the new works programme was shelved. All those improvements stopped, no investment happened for ages, and it's because, understandably enough, the government was prioritising um, repairing war damage and improving the national railway network and neglected London Underground as a result. It remained in national control until the beginning of the 60s when it came back to the control of the London body. First of all, an unelected London body, uh, the London Transport Board, which was appointed by the Secretary of State. And then in 1970, the London Transport Executive, which was appointed by the Greater London Council, which had been created a couple of years before then. So, London Transport Executive was unelected, but at least appointed by an elected body. And again, now it's back in the control of a London body, the investment increases. So over the late 60s and into the 70s, the Victoria Line opens, the Piccadilly Line is extended to Heathrow Airport, and the Jubilee Line, which was initially going to be called the Fleet Line, the Jubilee Line opens as well. But by the end of that decade, the funding is falling again, and it's starting to get in a bit of a decrepit state again. 1980s, right. At the end of the 70s, you had a Labour government and a Tory Greater London Council. Then, in 1979 and 1980, they swap places, and you've got a Tory government. <laughs> Sorry, couldn't help myself. You've got a Tory government led by Margaret Thatcher, and you've got a Labour GLC led by Ken Livingstone. They introduced a fares fare policy, which cuts fares right down, massively increases ridership on London Underground. Um, the Tories, through Bromley Council, get it declared illegal. And the GLC, having promised to stand up against that, then didn't. It kind of gave into it and put the fares right back up again. Um, 
there's a, there is a lot of people kind of think of Ken Livingston's GLC as a bit of a golden era and wasn't really, really left wing and stuff. But I'm going to put some ifs and buts on that because our union had lots of fights with them about working conditions. But it was also Livingston's GLC that started the process of removing guards from underground trains, um, which were bad, bad for jobs, bad for safety, etc. Um, I've, I've chosen my words very carefully there because otherwise someone will stick their hand up and say the Victoria Line has never had guards ever since 68. It's true. The Victoria Line was built without guards, but the actual the removal of guards from trains where they already where they were already there was a process begun by Ken Livingston. Okay. Also in 1984, the London Regional Transport Act, um, a in my view, initially an awful piece of legislation. And it made uh, London Transport act like a business. So this was the point at which London Underground stopped being called London Underground and started being called London Underground Limited. Right? It became a limited company of which the government was the sole owner. Okay, so it remains publicly owned, but it has to function as a business. Um, in 1986, the GLC was abolished and control of London Underground um, reverted to the government, which just took its funding away. The, the funding went down and down and down year on year. And also the way in which it was funded became much worse. It was funded through a process of annuality, which meant every November they were told what their grant was going to be for the next financial year. So London Underground couldn't plan any improvements or upgrades beyond the next 12 months. All it could plan for was what we call steady state maintenance. And it couldn't even afford that because the funding was so low. Team up five minutes. Okay? Oh, <coughs> let's speed up. So, funding goes down, but then something makes the funding go up again. You might like to reflect on the morality of a system in which it takes 31 people to die for funding to be, to be restored to something like uh, what it should be. 18th of November 1987, 31 people die in the King's Cross fire. As a result, which the inquiry led by Desmond Fennell produces a report 118 different proposals, all of which have been implemented to improve fire safety in the underground. I could actually probably do a five hour talk about those 118 proposals and have a look at practice, but I don't think you want me to. Okay. TLAs, three letter abbreviations CCT, PFI, and JLE. Okay, CCT, compulsory competitive tendering in the 1980s. This is what Margaret Thatcher's government did with public services, they couldn't just straightforwardly privatise, they found ways of getting the private sector to do bits of them. So in London Underground in the 80s, cleaning, catering, building works, etc., all contracted out to private companies. In 1992, they brought in a thing called the Private Finance Initiative, not just into the underground, but into health and education and all sorts of, um, all sorts of public services. That's just a list of the ones um, on London Underground from my book. Um, so it showed various bits of London Underground which were taken over on, under PFI, such as train maintenance on the North Line. Um, the biggest PFI-ish type thing is the Jubilee Line extension, um, begun or announced in 92. That should say 92 to 99, because if anyone who remembers it will know the mad rush to get it finished in time for the Millennium, because it's the tube that would take you to what is now the O2, it's originally called the Millennium Dome. And it was kind of, you know, it's a great bit of railway, it, it really is, but the process of getting it built was a disaster. It was really late, it was really over budget, it was really chaotic. Um, so we go into the 1997 general election. The tubes in a bad way, okay? The Tories say, we'll privatise London Underground. Seems to me that's the answer to the question. Tubes in a bad way, what is the only remaining way to make it even worse? Okay? The answer is privatise London Underground. The Labour goes into the general election um, promising a public private partnership, but not telling us what that means at that point. And uh, Labour win, and Labour get a bigger swing in London, 2% bigger swing in London than they do across the country as a whole, which you, could, you can't see directly into voters' minds, but it wouldn't be surprising if hostility to the policy of privatising London Underground might have been a contributing reason to that. Labour win, and these three chaps are key figures then in the, in the policy for London Underground. From top to bottom, Gordon Brown, John Prescott, Tony Blair. Um, interesting to that Tony Blair's one with his eye on the canvas smiling. <laughs> While the other two are a bit, bit grim. Um, okay, they introduce a policy called the Public Private Partnership. That's what it does to London Underground, okay? That's how it changes the way it's operated. They set up a Mayor, uh, Greater London Assembly, and Transport for London. So they bring back London wide government. Not in exactly the form I wanted to, but I think London wide government is a good idea. Okay? 
but they effectively, their public-private partnership, um, as, as, a, as a friend said to me, it, it's a partnership, a public-private partnership, it's a partnership in the same way that like a pork chop is a pig and butcher partnership. Okay, so what they did is they privatised the, uh, the maintenance, the infrastructure of the underground into three infra codes based on groups of lines, BCB, JMP, SSL, more TLAs. Um, and London Underground, which remained public, would pay an infrastructure check service charge as a fee to these private companies, which would increase and decrease according to bonuses for good performance and abatements for crap performances. There were a lot more crap performances than good performances. Mm -hmm. And one of the criticisms of this was the complexity of these contracts. And just to give you an example, one of the measures for which you'll get bonus or abatement was train ambience, right, which is how nice a train is to sit on. It's graffiti and stuff like that, right? This is the formula for measuring train ambience. <laughs> mm? Just train ambience alone, let alone the things you really want to know about, which is you know, how often there are signal failures or how fast your train goes or whatever, okay? Do you need Willow to wrap that up now? Huh? Oh, no, I'm, I'm going to race through the last bit. <laughs> okay, there was much opposition to the PPP, public opinion, the mayor, with the absence strikes. Experts were against it as well, but it was opposed in 2003. In practice, loads more bad incidents like broken rails, track safety compromise. The targets, you know, I said they had to meet targets, bonuses, abatements, all that. The targets were set 5% below what they were before, and they still missed them, okay? 278 engineering overruns in the first two years. That's when your first train runs late because they haven't finished doing the overnight work. The disabled access plans were abandoned, and there's a series of derailments. Chantry Lane, Hammersmith, Camden Town, White City. That's Mile End. That's the summer of 2007. Then it all collapsed in 2007. Metronet, one of the infra codes, went bankrupt. 2010, tube line was brought back into public ownership by TfL. And although they completely messed it up, the private companies walked away with their trousers stuffed full of pocket, stuffed full of money, okay? Million pound a week per profit. They paid themselves success fees, special distributions, dividends, and that's how much they cost the public sector, the collapse of this, okay? So it's quite a lot of money, just direct cost. One of the things that was in this contract with the private companies was that the public sector would be liable for 95% of their debts. 95%. So when Metronet collapsed, owing two billion pounds, we paid 95% of that debt. The only owner companies of Metronet only had to pay 5% of it. Okay? So now, London Underground is still publicly owned. The former Metronet is part of NUL again. Tube Lines is a separate company, although it's owned by Transport for London. We've still got lots of things contracted out, and it's no surprise that those are the ones that have the worst pain conditions, like cleaners working on the underground, appalling pain conditions. And what they're planning next, they want to close all the ticket offices this year, they want to cut 900 station staff, they want to bring in driverless trains a bit further into the future, they want to cut engineering and service control staff. Let's go back to these five factors. Funding only comes from free sources. <coughs> they might say, well, it comes from the private sector. It doesn't. It might come through the private sector. It comes either from fair payers or the government or minor other sources like advertising, okay? And London expects its fair payers to pay much more than other cities, comparable cities do. So that's from 1998, but still. Um, London Transport fares pay 70% of its cost, whereas in Paris, for instance, it's about 30%. Um, the other direction is government funding. Integration, better when London Underground is, is one whole thing rather than broken up into bits. Ownership, okay. Could go into one for hours about privatisation, um, but it, I think the history shows it does better when it's publicly owned. Governance, I think it does better when it's run by a London body, and preferably by an elected London body. Ethos, so what I meant by ethos, the fifth one is, is it seen as and allowed to operate as a public service, right, or is it a business? Or put a different way, are you guys passengers or are you customers? Okay, it seems to me it does better when you're passengers and we're a public service. <laughs> oh look, my book, I better find that, there's my book. And um, that's my final slide that says there's Julie's Bushel Stop Tour through 150 years of London Underground. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>